Hi, everyone, and here we are celebrating what people love to do creatively. I'm Rod Jones. And I'm Angie Jones. Welcome to the Thought Row podcast. We invite you to subscribe wherever you listen, and we are available virtually anywhere you listen to podcasts. No matter what you do creatively, this is the podcast for you. And, Iggy, what are we going to discuss today? Well, today we're going to be speaking with Jennifer Mazur about her mental wellness journey for creatives and how art has helped her with her journey. Mental wellness, you know, this has been a subject that more and more people need to talk about, need to talk about it candidly and kind of bring it out in the open. I'm glad we're having this conversation today on this show. Before we start, Isn't it time for you to share your quote? Yes. So our quote this week comes from a well-known actress. And here is her quote. What mental health needs is more sunlight, more candor, and more unashamed conversation. And that is by Glenn Close. Well, that's that's pretty special. That's a good one. Uh, coming from Glenn Coase, who's a well-known actress, she's probably had issues like that or had friends that were like that. I mean, what, as an actress, you have a very stressful job. So yes, you I do. could see that happening for her. Could you say it one more time, though? Sure. What mental health needs is more sunlight, more candor, and more unashamed conversation. Yeah, like we, you and I were discussing further, people will talk about other issues Like what? Right, exactly. Like they'll talk about diabetes or their cancer or heart attacks or anything like that. And and, and, but when it comes to mental illness or mental wellness, uh, they're a little bit reticent about talking about it publicly. And it's kind of a historical thing. I think through the ages, people just didn't want to ever mention that they were having any kind of emotional issue, which is unfortunate because most people are sympathetic. If you tell someone that you're kind of down and this is why you're feeling this way Mm -hmm. or you're depressed, most people, especially if they're a good friend, they're going to be supportive. They're going to sit there and try to help you through it. And having a good friend or somebody that you can talk to is a real blessing. Sure. And then that way, if you have a comfort zone, you're probably not going to be scared to go get help and go get medication or go get therapy or just, you know, have a counseling session with someone that it's so helpful. Absolutely. So helpful. So, okay, Rod, now it's time for our new segment, which is Rod's Motivational Moment. What do you have for us today? What I have for everybody today is self-judgment can be addictive. I think it kills your motivation. It creates anxiety to the point where you can't almost accomplish anything. Anything in your life becomes more and more difficult. Self-judgment can be addictive, and you should try to avoid it at all costs. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And I think everyone gets hit by that at one time or another in their lives. And when you're under stress, I feel like you self-judge even more. So, yeah, yeah that self-judging, you know, that's self-talk is what it really gets it's, down it's to. It's self-talk, yeah. It's self-talk. And you can have, I know everybody says, oh, think more positive. Think about that. Well, that's not always easy to do. But if you find yourself dwelling on something really negative, try to get it out of your system. And that encourages more judgment against yourself. You're judging yeah. yourself. Yeah. So that anyway, that's my thought for today. I, I think self judgment you're right on. can be addictive. Try to avoid that at all costs. I think you're right on on that. Thank you for sharing that. So Rod, have you noticed how many people we've connected with over the last year through social media that openly want to discuss their mental wellness? Yeah, that, that's really a good thing. And, and, you know, you don't want to always wear your, what's it called, heart on your sleeve. Right. Um, and that other thing, misery loves company. So if I'm miserable, I want you to be miserable too. Right. Uh, but the fact that people are talking about it more openly, uh-huh. that, you know, our guest today is going to be really right on when it comes to that topic. So social media does have some benefit there. Mm-hmm. Everything you see on social media where everybody is, you know, showing off everything absolutely perfect. That's really not always the case. You no. know, they were dealing with other things in their life. No, it's their pretend life. So when you when you see people on social media, Instagram, somewhat Facebook, but mostly Instagram, where they're showing how they're living lifestyles of their wonderful life. And really, it's not that way. It's staged. 
It's staged. There's filters. They don't look that good all the time. And you don't know all the things that they had to go through in their day. So really, it's not reality. It's a pretend world. Sure. If anything has turned out to be a good thing because it allows people to openly discuss and not feel like they are all alone and dealing with stress in life, again, getting back to what I said earlier and what you've been saying, Mm -hmm. is having at least one friend out there that is willing to listen to you and give you the opportunity to chat about it is really a good thing. Right on. In fact, there are podcasts that specifically address mental health and wellness issues. Yes. In fact, there are quite a few, actually. I remember hearing um, about one particular one, and his name was Paul Gilmartin, and he has a podcast called Mental Illness Happy Hour, and his website is mentalpod, mentalpod.com, And he addresses his own trials and tribulations with having mental health issues, his medication, his therapy. He's like no holds barred and very real. You know, there are several out there. There's a lot of podcasts that address this issue. Mm -hmm. You can Google Paul and check him out. And Angie just gave you his URL. Yeah. But check out others. You know, I'm sure you'll find one that you'll like adaptable, yeah. yeah, more adaptable to your own personal interest, but check one out. I mean, it's kind of an interesting thing to do. And when you listen to these types of shows, it gives you an opportunity to hear what other people are thinking and the experiences they went through. And from what I understand, you know, Paul has gone through it all and his guests really share what they've yeah. done and then people learn from that. I mean, he's got a huge following and the reason he has a huge following is because it gives people an opportunity getting back to that thing. You know, if you're mm-hmm. uncomfortable with yourself, it's interesting to know there's other people out there that are dealing with similar issues to you. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, check out Paul Gilmartin's show called Mental Illness Happy Hour if you're interested. Yeah. Or find one that suits you. And then also I wanted to to mention if there's one good thing about all that we've been hearing where people are having the opportunity to vent and share their feelings, we can all learn from one another and what they're going through and the processes they're going through. So you feel like you have a support system in a time when maybe you can't just dash out and go to counseling or or what have you. Yeah, I mean, it gives you an opportunity Calling a good friend or talking to a relative, or Mm -hmm. if you're younger, you can get good sage advice from your mother, your father, or more often than not, your grandparents. Your grandparents have been there. You know, they've lived a longer life. They've had lots of experiences. They certainly have had their ups and downs, and they can give you good advice or help you through a difficult time. And what you said about everything that's going on in the world today, there's a lot of anxiety and there's a lot of stress, Mm -hmm. but people need to understand this is a worldwide thing. It's not just targeting them personally, although a lot of people feel like, oh, well, what am I going to do? I'm just one person and here I am stuck in my home or they have to go outside with a mask on and that's uncomfortable too. Yeah, it feels kind of weird to have this mask on. You can't see anybody. Everyone seems a little faceless and you, you, you don't get the connectivity with, like you said, someone smiling at you or someone, you know, giving you a warm look. It's difficult behind that mask, but... Just know that everyone else is in that same boat with you. Yeah, I don't know if we discussed it, but just people, when you go out and you see other people because everybody's wearing masks, you Mm -hmm. can't see what they're saying or what they're feeling towards you. If somebody cuts you off with a shopping cart or whatever, they don't mean to do it. They turn, they smile at you, but you can't see them smiling or you can't hear very easily what they're saying if they're apologizing, whatever. So give every, give the people around you a break because this has been some kind of year for the whole world. Yeah. And hopefully something good will come of it, come out of all this chaos. I think so. I think a lot of good is coming out of it because I see more kindness and more consideration and more caring towards others. And the interesting thing is, is the people that are, I don't want to say the haters, but the really negative people of the world are kind of being pushed to the corners of the room where love and kindness are kind of growing in the middle and pushing everybody out. I I agree with you. And I see that. And even in our own family, but I also see that when we meet other people, 
and mostly that's just related to us going out and picking up some food. Yeah. And that's where we meet the most people these days. But that's all changing. So it's getting better and better. Mm-hmm. Um, keep the faith. Everything will turn out just great. Yeah. But if you're having a little anxiety, talk to someone. Tell them how you feel. I'm sure they'll tell you how they feel. Mm-hmm. Just discuss it. Exactly. And then also, I think that some people are starting to revisit and embrace their hobbies, or they're just starting a brand new one because they want to try something new and they have the time and they have, you know, maybe some inclination towards this area that they've never tried out before. And it probably has helped a lot of people maintain their mental health and mental wellness and painting really seems to be a popular one that helps people. In fact, you know, they do have art therapy. Yeah, art therapy. Veterans are are becoming real. They're starting to embrace art therapy because it really, it works really well. It gives somebody a way to refocus and get out of that, maybe that negative self-talk. There are lots of things you can do. Painting seems to be a good one. You can find lots of classes at YouTube videos on art therapy. There's lots of information out there on art therapy. But there's other things that you can do, like just plain old baking a cake. True. So get out there and then try uh, a YouTube video on painting or go home and bake yourself some bread or cake. Oh, talk about the bread. Okay. Um, you know, I personally love to bake, you know that. Yes, I'm and happy cook, about that. And and you get you get to eat all the good stuff and, and I think that the whole process of baking and cooking really is soothing because it's very repetitive. And also you get to smell you so you're getting aromatherapy. And when you go to eat it, a lot of it is more of a, a carb-based... Uh, it's a comfort food. It's a comfort food, and it makes you feel happy when you're eating it. So try it. You know what? Let's hear what our guest has to say about dealing with her mental wellness journey. Okay. Jennifer, welcome to the Thought Row podcast. Both Angie and I have been really looking forward to chatting with you for actually quite some time. Hi, yes, Jennifer. So good to have you with us today. Great. I'm so glad I'm here. This is uh, something I've really been looking forward to. So hi, guys. Hi, hi. (laughs) (laughs) Good. You know, we actually met you through Gabriella Abacassus. Abacassus. Thank yeah. you. I got it right this time. You did. It's such it's such a beautiful name, and <laughs> it I, is. for some reason, I have to write it out phonetically so I say it correctly. Right. But we know she interviewed us, but she also interviewed you recently, and I hope everyone has a chance to listen to your interview with her on IGTV. Yes, yeah, so true. Um, everyone. Please go to her IGTV and and take a listen. But we're so excited to have you here with us today, Jennifer. But before we move on our interview, we always like to ask our guests our trademark question. What did you have for breakfast, Jennifer? (laughs) Today I had a really quick breakfast. So it was basically coffee. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up having a little bit of yogurt with some frozen berries in it. And yeah, that was that's pretty standard for me during the week. Nothing that sounds exciting. really healthy and really easy and you don't have to cook anything. So all the check marks are yes. <laughs> yeah, except it doesn't really keep you full. That's the... No, true. <laughs> you, then the you downside. have to snack then later, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So our guest, Jennifer is talking to us from a country that we have not visited and she is from she's talking to us from Sweden so tell us a little about what it's like where you live and how you got there yeah and how you got there <laughs> sure um well I'm American I'm from Florida born in New York raised in Florida and I moved to Sweden about 20 years ago actually oh wow and um can't believe I'm still here. I had initially come over on what I thought would be a two-year plan uh, just after I graduated from university to travel and, you know, Mm -hmm. just enjoy Europe a little bit. But I I completely fell in love with Sweden and I've pretty much been here ever since. That's a great place Um, to be. Yeah, so pretty. It it really, it really is. It's absolutely gorgeous. I live in Stockholm and the city is made up. I think we have 
14 different islands in the city. So oh it's goodness. everything is surrounded by water. Absolutely beautiful. And I mean, one of the things that I really love about living in Sweden is the balance between work and private life. It's something yeah. that's really, really valued here. Oh, that's good. That's you know? great. Yeah. Yeah. And I have, uh, I'm a single mom. I have a daughter. She's 12. And this is just the best place really to have, to have a family. All of the health care for her is free. University is free. Um, you know, it's standard to get at least five weeks vacation. When she was born, I had a year off paid maternity leave. So it's, you can't really compare. Makes, <laughs> makes for uh, very healthy children. Exactly. And I might add well-adjusted children. And also for the moms, too. It makes the moms well-adjusted, too. Yeah, it makes too. the moms <laughs> well-adjusted and happy. You know, it's, it's actually the dads here as well, which I think is really interesting because it's one-year maternity leave, roughly. Mm -hmm. And the fathers are required to take two months of that. Oh, so great. it's um, It's so like nice. you use it or you lose it. If they decide not to take it, the mom can't. So it's, it's really encouraging for both parents to be at home, which I yeah. think is pretty How cool. lovely. Jennifer, for quite some time, we've wanted to chat with someone who has faced creative challenges um, because of mental health. Yeah, that's so true, Rod. I know we have many creative people around the world that have to deal with mental health issues. Jennifer, why do you consider yourself a mental wellness artist? Well, that's that's something that's actually quite new. It's a newer realization for me. Yeah, I've always just been what I would consider a figurative mixed media artist. But recently, it's become pretty clear in my life that I really value mental wellness through my background, my personal background, through what I'm seeing through society, mm -hmm. um, especially on social media. And so I realized that my, my biggest goal in not only being an artist, but a person is helping people that have some sort of diagnosis. So anything from ADD to depression to PTSD, you know, um, autism, whatever it may be, for them to understand that a diagnosis doesn't define us. It's just a piece of who we are. Mm -hmm. And I'm working really hard to, to, you know, smash the stigma of mental health. Well, as you just mentioned, there are a lot of people in this world that have mental issues. And of course, what everybody's been going through over the last year yeah. certainly wasn't a, a cakewalk for a lot of people. Right. But how is it impact? I know it impacts their creativity, but how has it impacted your creativity? I think it's actually enriched my creativity. I think that's actually the one gift. If there is a gift of this pandemic, it has given me so much time to focus on my art and focus on my creativity and really, really to develop it. And, you know, I see, I see deeper meaning and purpose coming through in my art and it's, you know, it's, it's daily therapy for me. So I think it's, no, oh, I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's really evolved quite a lot during this time. You know, we've heard that and also read that about a lot of uh, creative people that are, you know, ex experiencing this really nice surge of creativity through their art because I think you were you were allowed to have the time to do it during the pandemic, which maybe would have taken the average person doing something just on the weekend or once a month kind of moved you ahead. Uh, so much more because you were able to really concentrate on it and, you know, really experience that whole creativity process. Absolutely. Right. And I wanted to ask you, how did you come to terms with the challenges and the impacts on your life? I think the biggest, the biggest thing for me is that I've spent most of my life dealing with depression and, you know, that's been a real struggle for me. And the other thing, thing is i i've spent most of my life feeling really stupid <laughs> unable to achieve anything uh really a complete failure and for example it took me four different universities to be able to complete my bachelor's degree and i couldn't understand why i really thought it had something to do with my drive and um it you know, probably really had to do be, with the fact that you're very intelligent right. and you can't cope with that right 
<laughs> no, it was. <laughs> I wish that was. I wish that was the answer. I think it was. You know, from a very young age, I was afraid of being singled out for not understanding things, and quite often I didn't understand things in the in the classroom. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, quite often with girls, you know, the girls that are quiet, sitting in the back of the classroom, not asking questions, uh, they're overlooked and. They make up a huge portion of the kids that have some sort of diagnosis, such as dyslexia, ADD, ADHD. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're just they're just seen as the quiet little girls that don't need any help. And I think that was that was the case with me. And so I actually didn't get um, an evaluation of ADD until I was 40, Mm -hmm. which meant I spent all of that time with really low self-confidence and even when it came to my artwork, it was it was everything. I was just going to say you're very lucky that ultimately you did because yeah. I had dyslexia, still do actually, yeah. but when I was going to school, they didn't even understand it or even give a – They didn't a, know they, it was They a didn't thing. even have yeah. a real name for it. No. They just considered that you were addled. Slow. Yeah, slow. slow. And um, Exactly. I personally could relate to what you're saying right now. Right. Yeah. I was just going to ask when they when they diagnosed you with ADD, did you feel like this relief of oh, there's not something wrong with me? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I can remember getting a package from you know from the company from the therapist that did the evaluation. It came in the mail, and I went straight to my bedroom and locked the door. And I just remember sitting on the floor and reading the results. And seeing that I actually was above average on several of the areas that they had had done the IQ tests on, Mm. Um, just that I process things a bit slower. And I I remember just this huge feeling of relief and these tears just running down my face. But then I also remember was that the next page or, or there was a there was a letter that was attached from the therapist basically saying, yes, you have been diagnosed with ADD. But this is not something you need to disclose to anybody. And that's when I realized, oh, "Oh my God, there is a huge stigma. Because here I was feeling so incredibly relieved. Yeah. Um, You know, I finally realized I wasn't lazy. I wasn't stupid. And the shame came with it. Like... (laughs) I was horrified. That's interesting that they would say that. Yeah, that's so weird. I would think they'd say, no, now you can tell everybody this and they will have an understanding of your thought process. Now I don't think it's such a stigma. You know, if I tell people that I have dyslexia and I write something backwards, whatever, or I mispronounce a name, I can always go, I jokingly say, hey, it just must be dyslexia. Dyslexia. And I think right. people need to understand that. I mean, none of us are perfect no. and we all have little issues that we deal with. But I want to, you know, you're best known for your art. What message are you trying to convey through your art? I mean, we've seen a lot of it on yeah. Instagram and it's very impressive. It but what, what, if I could ask you this question, what message are you trying to convey through the art that you're currently doing? I think the main thing for me is to really stress the fact that nobody's life is perfect. And a lot of times when we're looking on social media, Instagram, for example, we see these people posing with, you know, perfect living rooms or, or perfect houses, picture perfect children, the meals that look like they came out of some gourmet (laughs) restaurant, Um, you know, perfect hair, perfect nails, perfect everything. And that's just not the way life is. And when I was talking to friends and people that I know that are dealing with a lot of their own, you know, self-esteem issues, there's a lot of comparison going on, a lot of low self-worth. And I think the whole, um, you know, Instagram or social media facade is really, really unhealthy, especially for people that are not feeling that good to begin with. So my thing is, I want people to understand that, you know, everybody has bad days. It's okay to spend the day in your pajamas or, you know, eat a pint of Ben and Jerry's. These these things are going to happen, you know, Mm -hmm. leave your dishes in the sink until the next day. And that's just as real as you know, the the going out and having a great time, all these different snapshots are what make up our lives. And the other thing that I feel is even more important, I think people, because they want to portray these perfect lives, they're not honest. They, they hide their diagnosis or they hide the fact that they're depressed. 
And so one of the things that I've done with my last uh, collection is I'm focusing on these different women and I'm giving them all different personalities. So, for example, with me, I might say something like, you know, I'm Jennifer. I live in Sweden. I've been here for 20 years. Um, I love pizza and and sushi. I hate to exercise. Um, (laughs) I've traveled to 35 different countries, terrified of snakes, and I have ADD. And I think ADD is probably the least interesting thing. Well, maybe not the least interesting thing on the list, but certainly not the most interesting thing. No, but there's people out there, there's people out there that can relate. And I think one of the big issues with social media is people are always trying to get likes and thumbs ups and all that. And if they don't, then they feel bad that day. It's like they're being, their whole life is being judged by who's liking them and how many followers they have. And I, I'm starting to see people and we try to interview people such as yourself that right. are very real and honest people about their feelings and their emotions. And this and is why their we, lives. Yeah, their lives. This is yeah. why we really appreciate mm-hmm. having you as a guest because this is this is what it's really all about. And we hope our listeners connect with you on that level. Angie, I think you have a next question. Right, I do. And I know you probably know this, but there have been some really famous artists that have faced mental health challenges. Have you learned anything from reading their journeys? You know, I think the, the thing that really stands out to me is when I look at their art, their art really screams stories. Um, you always wonder what's behind these paintings or, or photographs or, you know, mm-hmm. whatever media they're using. Um, and myself as an artist, I've learned that I need to get it out. And so often these these artists that have the history of, of mental mental illness or mental health challenges are seen as, you know, they're very misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it's a really important part of ourselves and and part of history. And uh, it's part of life and it it needs to be out there. Life is not just something that's beautiful and perfect all the time. So it's it's a great way to convey different messages. And there's been some artists out there that if you read their biographies, they certainly had challenges from family members all oh, the way yeah. down to oh, society. Yeah. They've been outcasts, mm. uh, but there have been, been a lot of them that were readily acceptable. Uh, Jennifer, I want to mm-hmm. know if it's okay to ask, when was it that you first came to the realization that your creative life was being impacted by mental wellness? Yeah, this was something that happened recently because I I lost my mom last year um, mm. during the pandemic. Mm. Um, I'm so sorry to hear that. And that was that. yeah, it was it was devastating. I mean, not only just losing my mom, whom I was very close to, but also you know during the pandemic there was no funeral, there was no very little closure. Right. And so for a while, I I wasn't even able to enter my studio. It was just, I mean, there was, there was absolutely no way. And then I found that when I was able to enter again, my art was completely changing. So from being, you know, light and and beautiful portraits or flowers, I was, I was creating a lot of scribbling hard art with charcoal, really angry, really Mm -hmm. sad, uh, sad, portraits and, and whatnot. And eventually it started to evolve to the collection that that I recently completed that I just mentioned called Windows. Mm-hmm. And I realized that's that's because it focuses on our eyes being a window to our soul. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't really understand what the meaning was behind it, why I was creating what I what I was creating. But there's an art group that I belong to. And one of the things that they really encourage is understanding the psychology of what you're creating. Oh. And by going through that process, I realized exactly why I was doing what I was doing, how it was all connected. And that's when I realized that it was really, you know, not only my mental health, but I realized at that point that I wanted to help others with theirs as well. Well, that's really, wow. It's really great that you were channeling that energy that you had going on because it's so emotional and so expressive. I think it's I think it's good that you defined the fact that yeah. artists do have a tendency, and it's not just people that paint, people that write, people mm-hmm. that, that compose music. They channel a lot of their inner feelings 
I think that's why they're so sensitive to being judged. Yeah, and we know many of our listeners may be dealing with mental health issues right now. What advice can you give them? I think first and foremost is that just for them to realize they're not alone. This past year has been difficult on so many people. Oh, yeah. Just the levels of isolation have been so, so difficult. So the first thing that I would say is find some sort of community that supports you. It doesn't matter if, you know, you're reaching out to friends and family or if you even, you know, find just some sort of online group, anything, just so you have you can socialize in some way. The second thing I think is that, you know, we really need to be kind to ourselves right now because things are so difficult. It will get better, but this is this is where we are right now. And the last thing, and this is something that has helped me out a lot, is to make small goals. Quite often when I'm feeling bad, people will tell me things like, oh, just go for a walk or, you know, just do something you like to do. And when you're in a really bad place, going for a walk is probably so off the chart. It's just it's not going to happen. So start with really small goals. And that can be anything from just I'm going to get out of bed today. Or, you know, today I'm actually going to take a shower. And to people that are not, you know, that have not dealt with depression or, you know, other other issues where they're feeling really bad, that sounds really silly. But to people that are in those really low, dark places, even doing those things are really difficult. Little and steps. Then, little, yeah, little steps. Yeah, yeah, baby steps. Absolutely. And then I think one of the best things you can do is to try something creative and that's you know anything at all because it it really does it really does help so much oh yeah you know creativity is uh not one size fits all uh and neither is mental health how can others use art to help them deal with their own mental issues you you were i think you are the poster child for understanding how art could be, (laughs) how it could impact it. But what would you say? I would say find any kind of creative activity that you enjoy. And it absolutely does not have to be painting or drawing. It can be cooking. It can be dancing, singing, you know, playing an instrument, baking, writing, sewing. You know, there's so many possibilities. There are so many things that you can do, Mm -hmm. um, you know, to tap into that creative creative energy. Art is not going to take care of everything, but it definitely helps. You know, and they talk about all this, this science to back it up, you know, things like the cortisol. I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but I think it's the cortisol level. It's cortisol for sure. Oh, good, good. And, and raising your dopamine and, you know, I, I'm really bad with that stuff because I have ADD and I'm really bad at, at, science in general and math, but it's it's been proven that it helps so much. And, you know, it gives us an outlet, uh, a way to express things that maybe we find really difficult to do verbally mm-hmm. and to do without judgment. You know, just get it out of your system in one way or another. There are a lot of things that you can do nutritionally. We always suggest that people research it thoroughly so they have a good understanding. And then they should always look to see if there's any potential side effects. Certain nutritional supplements are really helpful for a lot of people. I mean, we both Angie and I have used them right. and still are real cognizant of, of what we use nutritionally. But our advice mm-hmm. is always check it, you know, check that stuff out thoroughly. Make right, sure it right. works for you. Yeah. Right. Right. And um, we were talking earlier about art therapy indirectly, but we often hear that art is therapy. And in fact, there are actually art therapy classes like for veterans for their to help them deal with PTSD and other kinds of art classes. Do you ever see yourself teaching others how to use art to heal themselves? I do. I mean, I I don't. I'm not a licensed art therapist, but I have taken lots of different courses on art therapy. Mm -hmm. And I host a a webinar on, well, it's it's not that regular. Actually, I have the second one coming up this Friday. Mm -hmm. But the people that attended the first one have asked that we do it. it. It's me and one other artist that we do it on a regular basis. And the whole, you know, the whole point with that is to teach people 
you know, that they can use art as a therapy to help with anxiety, to help with stress, to help with depression. And what we usually do is we we talk a little bit about our situations and then we teach them a couple of different techniques to mm-hmm. use where you don't need to be an artist, you know, by any means. It's it's just, you know, picking up a pen and a, and a piece of paper and yeah. just showing, you know, how to you know, how to move some of that stress and anxiety and just, just release it, just get it out. Well, you are an authority. Yeah. So because, because you've lived it. You've lived it. So it's yeah. So yeah. licensed or unlicensed, you're not you're not begging people to adhere to what you're saying. You're just giving them sharing with them your personal experiences. Right. Mm. I you know, the other thing I wanted to ask you is I know people will have the opportunity to see your art on your website and on social media. And I think some people that we've already suggested look at your art have made comments to us about it. Yeah. But can you describe your style? This is a podcast, so we can't hold up one of your yeah, paintings. Yeah, we can't hold your paintings. Right, right. <laughs> well, most of the work that I do is portraiture, but I would say that it's very figurative portraiture. Mm-hmm. It's not any one that you're going to recognize. It it almost has this dreamlike air to it. I think it's very wispy. It, it's light and airy. It's very imperfect because I, I do it very intuitively. And, you know, I view us all as imperfect creatures. You know, mm-hmm. what do they say? Perfectly imperfect. So that's something that I that I try to convey in my art. And I just think it's very... It's very honest. It comes directly from my heart. And I hope that people, you know, realize that when they come across it. I think they do. I think when they view your art, they can see the genuineness and the emotion and being passion, very passionate. Yeah. Passion about what you're doing. So, okay, I I need to ask you, what do you think about when you're actually creating a painting? It's different. It, it's completely different because it depends on my mood. Usually, when I when I go into the studio, sometimes it can be based on people that I know and things that I know they're going through. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of my friends that have a different type of diagnosis. You know, if I'm talking to them, then they're on the the forefront of my mind, uh, and then I might create something for them. But a lot of them are just completely fictitious. It might be. Something, you know, a story I've heard, something I've seen on Netflix or just somebody that completely pops into my pops into my mind. And I just try to uh, think about giving them a story and bringing them to life and making them be more than a diagnosis and trying to show a little bit of courage to be themselves. And, you know, quite often when I'm in my studio, I think about my mom a lot because she was she was an artist as well. Oh, OK. And that gives me a lot of inspiration. Yeah, even some divine inspiration, yeah. I would suspect. So you've you've talked about this throughout our interview so far, but I think everybody, all creative people want to know what other creative people's lives are like or what their day is like. So what would you how would you describe your creative day? I would say that it's not as creative as I would like it to be. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, Welcome to the you know, world one, of art. right, exactly. And I think that when most people think about an artist, they think about somebody sitting in their studio all day long, just creating art. And unfortunately, it doesn't actually look like that because to be a full-time artist, so much time is spent on stupid little administrative things or marketing marketing is marketing. the number one oh thing oh my god you, you, paint, or, or, you paint 20% of the time and 80% of the time you're yeah. out marketing it yeah 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 and i think just figuring out finances and ordering supplies and shipping th- packaging and shipping things it's um you know i right now i try to spend about 6 hours a week creating so if you imagine a 40 hour work week, it's really a small portion of the time mm-hmm. that I get to create. But I would say I, I do spend a little bit of time every day. If it's not on, you know, the the anything for my collection or anything that I'm aiming to have in a gallery or sell, just, you know, for myself, mm-hmm. it can be in a sketchbook or I do a little online, a lot of online art studios where artists from around the world can come and join and 
a lot of that work is just, you know, to stay in the practice of being creative and to just express myself. That's more the art therapy, definitely the art therapy stuff. Right. Good for you. But yeah. I, yeah. And I think for me, when I'm getting into that creative mode, I do a lot of meditation, I think, just trying to get myself into a, into a good place. And then I'll, I'll try and do some general warm-up exercises before I actually take out the expensive materials and the, and the canvases. Right. And it can be anything from uh, sketching or scribbling. And I have to say that quite often when I'm in a really bad mood or angry or sad, a really, really strong emotion, I may actually start by just pulling out a canvas and scribbling all of my thoughts down, almost like journaling on the canvas mm -hmm. and use that as a starting point. That's a good, and attitude, then, very good technique yeah, to do it that. Is. You get, just, yeah, you get you started. I, yeah, and I work layered, so it's so that's going to be covered. Along, you know, you, mm -hmm. you won't see that, but it's a great way to get started. And when I'm in a good place, which, you know, luckily is more of the time these days, most of the time these days, I might start my canvas by writing like a blessing or some sort of affirmation, a message, like a secret message to whoever the collector ends up being, mm -hmm. uh, like sending my pieces off with a bit of a happy blessing or something. That's very cool. I've known artists that paint eight, 10 hours a day six days a week. And I have to tell you something that they always seem to reveal to me as I talk to them. They're just not very interesting people. They're really quite boring. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, all they, all they could do is talk. They're wearing one note. All they do is A talk about art. And then if you want to go outside of that realm, even for a second, they can't handle it. Now they turn wow. on some really wow. beautiful art, I have to give sure. them credit for that, but they are so, sure. so focused. And I know I can personally can never be that way. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. How do you overcome having overwhelming feelings or thoughts when you want to paint? I think when I start to paint, they automatically just start to fade away. Um, mm -hmm. The creativity takes over and that's one of the reasons why I do it. I feel that when I'm focusing on my art and I really get into flow, my head doesn't have the space to do both. You mm -hmm. know, I'm either going to be sad or frustrated or in a bad place, or I'm going to be focusing on the art. And thankfully, the art usually wins. And like I said before, sometimes I'll just journal right on the on the artwork to get it out right. and cover it up. But thankfully. Thankfully, the art generally wins and the, the overwhelming feelings or, or anxiety just fades away naturally. I think you've, an, you've kind of answering the question I have for you next. I think we all psych ourselves out when we first start a work of art. Mm -hmm. I know I do. Me too. I think you do. Me too. Um, you seem to have come up with a real solution. Uh, when did you discover your approach? I think it's been something uh, gradual over the years. And I know I got some really good advice a few years ago. You know, when you have that new sketchbook in front of you, and at least for me, I'm always afraid of messing up the first page. Yeah. <laughs> you want it to be just perfect. So somebody had recommended that you actually start with the last page and work your way towards the front. Oh, okay. And... I found that approach to be really, really interesting. And so because it's no longer pristine anymore, it's been it's been touched. So I think that's where I've taken the approach with the canvas as well. When you're staring at a white canvas, it's really overwhelming. Yeah. But if you just put one mark down, it's no longer perfect. And that kind of gives you the freedom to to get in there and play. And then the fact that there's always just so you can always cover it up and start over. True. So, Very yeah. true. Yeah. So what steps do you take for self-care? Do you meditate or journal? I do. I started doing, I don't know if you've heard of morning pages. Yes, I have. It's wonderful. Yeah. It's wonderful. They're, they're really, they're great. I do them every single morning. Uh -huh. In fact, our daughter, our daughter does that. She does do it. Every does she? Yeah. Yes. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. I think I think it's Julia Cameron, isn't it? Yes, is Cameron it is. her last name? Uh -huh. And she wrote a book many years ago called The Artist's Way. Mm -hmm. And that's something that she she recommends. 
And it just, I feel that it really gets all the negativity, all of the just like busyness in my head out. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's, that's the first thing I do every day. In fact, my partner has actually learned that if I'm if I'm propped up in the bed writing, just bring me the coffee. Don't ask if I want coffee. <laughs> See, that's perfect. <laughs> it, it is perfect. And I do a lot of meditation, um, although that's generally something that I do at night to end the day. And I have to say that because I have been dealing with depression for most of my life, that I've learned to kind of read my cues. And I try to be kind to myself. And if I know I'm really down today. I give myself permission to just, you know, take a nap, take a bath, just stay on the sofa all day. And then I I find that it usually passes if I listen to myself from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Well, the next question, you've actually answered this, especially the part about journaling. You know, if you were to give when you personally or any artist gets bogged down by unproductive thinking in their lives. I mean, we all have a tendency to question ourselves. I think you probably understand that better than most questioning ourselves, questioning our ability, questioning what may the outcome might be for the day that we approach creativity. Do you have any thoughts in that area? I mean, absolutely journaling. But another thing that I have found really helps me is affirmations. And I I know it sounds really like woo woo, but I I really, I no good. I mean, I really believe in affirmations. And one thing that I've found is not all affirmations work. I'll, I'll actually write down the ones that work for me, the Mm -hmm. ones that really resonate. Mm -hmm. And then I may sit down with a journal and just repeat one or two of them for an entire page or even you know, meditate, thinking about those affirmations and just, yeah, just try and get yourself in a, in a better place where you can, you can tell those unproductive thoughts to, Mm -hmm. to get out. (laughs) They They have no room. I have an affirmation that I put on my microphone to tell myself to enunciate (laughs) <laughs> I don't, is that an affirmation? <laughs> not really an affirmation. An affirmation. No. Maybe it's something it's I hit myself. It's more like a hint. <laughs> yeah, a hint. <laughs> it's a hint. You, you have to change it to, I enunciate beautifully. There you go. There something. you go. Okay, so this is, you've been incredibly interesting to chat to. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? Or where do you see yourself in five years? In five years. Definitely working a lot more with mental health organizations. There's been a lot of resistance with the mental health orgs in Sweden, unfortunately. And so I've I've been in contact with a lot in the UK. I definitely like to work with the US more since, you know, I'm I'm American. So right. I'd like to be able to raise money for them, auction off artwork, blog, what any way that I can help other people. So I'd like to be doing that on a regular basis. I just want to give back to as many people as I possibly can, uh, help to diminish the stigma. You know, my dream would be to be seen as a pioneer in mental wellness art and, of course, to sell my art all over the world, you know, in in galleries and and to different collectors that need need to see it, need to have it and really connect with it. I'm sure it's going to happen. Yeah, I'm sure it is, too. I'm sure it is. going. Sounds good. (laughs) Okay, so now we're going to ask you a question that we have been asking our guests on the podcast. If you could sit on a park bench and chat with anyone from the past, who would it be? Yeah, and I could answer that instantly. I mean, since since I just lost my mom, it would obviously be her. Yeah. Um, you know, she had a very long, painful illness. And so first and foremost, I would just want to make sure that she's okay, that she's at peace. But also my art career has really taken off in the past year. It, it's, I can't even explain how, how That's different. So <laughs> the, yeah, it's been absolutely wonderful. And there's a piece of me that is just so devastated that she didn't, she didn't get to experience it. She didn't get yeah. to see it. Um, I had my first solo exhibit in January and I, you know, I can remember as a child seeing my mom at her solo exhibits and how proud she was. And, um, mm-hmm. She was just glowing, and I, I just wish she had gotten a chance to see, 
to see me in the same the same place. You know what though? She's with you. Yeah, so we, she we, sees we, you. Yeah, we th- we're pretty. Sh- yeah, we're pretty confident that she knows what's she's going on, you. and she's rooting I, for I you. So, and she may be the one who's helping open doors That's for you. That's so true. Do you know what? I absolutely believe that, and I can actually sometimes feel her when I'm sitting in the studio. It's like I can feel her wrapping her arms around me when I'm sitting there painting. And I know she's opening these doors. Yeah. I just love to have a a two-way conversation with her about it. Well, you know, you can kind of meditate your way into that, I think. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Well, what do you want, Jennifer? What do you want to be most remembered by? I know that's a tough one. That's a hard one. It is. It is. But I think the most important thing is that I that I helped people, that I inspired, that I gave people a, a bit of a nudge, you know, to be really loud and proud about who they are and mm-hmm. to not feel the shame and, you know, to just really make a difference to, to people worldwide in their mental, mental mm-hmm. wellness uh, journey. And of course, I want to be known as an amazing artist <laughs> as well. Yeah, all of that. Oh, very good. You know, I think the fact that you really explain mental wellness and its impact on creativity, I think that's been right now, I think that's something that we would want to remember you by. You're obviously talented, you're a great artist, that's a given. Right. But going through the challenges that you faced and maybe still face to this day, your mental wellness journey, I think, has been very inspiring. Right. And also so helpful for people. I think that with our last year being so strange and difficult for people that have been isolated, like you said earlier, it really has been helpful to have other people share their trials and tribulations, their journey and what they do to help themselves. So it's so great that you're out there really you know, contributing to people. Yeah, our journeys are always all so different, but mm-hmm. yet they have a common thread. They all seem to, we all seem to go back to the same thing, you know, how we feel emotionally mm-hmm. and how balanced we are. True. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. And Jennifer, it's this has been so informative and I'm, I'm sure it's going to help a lot of people at least point them in the right direction to maybe get the help they need or maybe take self-care actions in their life. I agree with what you just said in the thing, Jennifer, you've been very candid yeah. uh, in discussing me- your ment- your personal mental wellness journey. And I hope people will learn from your experiences. Maybe they can adopt some of the strategies that you have. Mm -hmm. Uh, That could be really Mm -hmm. beneficial to them. True. And also, I want to let everyone know, if you want to know more about Jennifer Mazur and her artwork, we will have links in the show notes and also under the show guest tab on thoughtrowpodcast.com. So everyone can learn more about her and please connect with her on social media. Great, great. This has been such a great opportunity. And I really want to thank the both of you for for having me on. And also say to anybody that's, you know, that's out there listening that, you know, you don't have to be as candid as me, you don't have to go out there and, and shout to the world. But find at least one person that you can confide in and, you know, baby steps, baby steps, and one day at a time, and it starts to feel better, and you'll get there. Wonderful. We love that. Thank you so much. Thank you for chatting with us today, Jennifer. You've been a fabulous guest. Yes. Oh, thank you. I'm really glad you tuned in today. We hope you enjoyed the thoughts and ideas we shared with you. We post a new podcast every week, so remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss an episode. So it's bye for now from my husband Rod and I, wishing everyone a great day.